श्री रूप साधुचात सह गनाथांडितम सजीव साधवैत सवदूत परिच सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य देव श्रीराधान कृष्ण पादान सह गनादिता श्री विशाता नमो विष्णु पादा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते वेदात स्वामी नामने नमस्ते सारस्वते देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे हे विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे नमो महाबद न्याय कृष्ण प्रेम प्रदाये कृष्णाय कृष्ण चैतन्य नाम गौरक्षे नम हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीन बंधो जगत्पते गोपेश गोपिका कांता नमस्ते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी दावेदेवरी विषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर शिवासादिगौंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय श्री अस्तरिंग श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो वन चैप्टर फोर Before we begin chapter four, let's do a brief revision of what has been discussed in the previous chapters. Shrimad Bhagavat Mahapuram is a scripture in which there are different dialogues going on. Different different personalities. So the main dialogue is the one which is happening, which we are studying between the sages of Naini Sharanya and Sutta Goswami. Within that dialogue, then will come the dialogue of Shukde Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit, and within that dialogue. will come many other dialogues in the future so in the first three chapters of shrimad bhagavatam canto 1 we come to know about the background of why shrimad bhagavatam was spoken by sut goswami to the sages who had assembled at the forest called namisharan thousands of sages had come together to perform sacrifices we should know one thing it is very interesting actually if you understand this that assembly of sages was not of one kind of sage there were different kind of sages who had come together to perform the sacrifice it was something like a kumbh mela in a kumbh mela different kinds of sadhus ascetics yogis they come there are mayavadis also there are brahmavadis also there are yogis also there are devotees also right they all come together for some kind of spiritual rejuvenation likewise all the sages from all parts of the world had decided to come together at the forest called namishana but 
their intention of coming there was not same the goal was same a big goal was there that we will all come together and perform sacrifice for the welfare of people in general but there was difference of opinion some were thinking we will come together and do fire sacrifice some were thinking we'll come together and chant some vedic mantras some were thinking we'll come together and do some tapasya and there were some who thought we will come together and hear about krishna we will hear about krishna right so those people who were had this interest that you want to hear about krishna they appointed sudh goswami as the speaker and they told sudh goswami that you please speak to us and they asked six questions which you all studied in the first three chapters the first question was what is the ultimate good for everyone second question what is the essence of all the scriptures third question why did krishna appear as a son of devaki and vasudeva fourth question what are the different purusha avatars and what are their activities fifth question what are the different leela avatars of the lord and sixth question when lord krishna uh lord krishna left the planet along with krishna religion also went right knowledge also went so now in who religion and knowledge has taken shape right is it that was the last question and the answer to the last question was shrimad bhagavata krishna sadham bhagate dharma jnana dhuri sah kalau nashta drsham yesha purana arbhut nodhitah this was the answer given by sudh goswami so sudh goswami has answered all the six questions asked by the sages right isn't it he has given that answer and sudh goswami then told the sages who had assembled there that because your questions are very nice and i have given the answer to you in, in gist but in detail if you want to hear the answer i am going to now narrate to you the entire shrimad bhagavatam i am going to speak the whole shrimad bhagavatam to you right this is what sudh goswami told the sages who were assembled so this has been done now we go to chapter 4 shloka number 1 chapter 4 of first canto shloka number 1 vyasa uvacha iti bruvanam sanstuya muninam dirga satrinam priddha kulapati sutam ba ba prichah shonako prave on hearing sut goswami speak thus shonak muni who was the elderly learned leader of all the rishis engaged in that prolonged sacrificial ceremony congratulated sudh goswami by addressing him as follows so when sudh goswami said i'll speak on shrimad bhagavatam shonak rishi who was the leader of all the sages he stood up and he congratulated sudh goswami he he congratulated that yes he is very nice you should speak shriman bhagavata will read the purport in a meeting of learned men when there are congratulations or addresses for the speaker the qualifications of the congratulator should be as follows let me just show it on screen for everyone if you're not able to follow like that so that everyone can read he must be the leader of the house and an elderly man he must be vastly learned also she shonak rishi had all these qualifications and thus he stood up to congratulate shri sudh goswami 
when he expressed his desire to present Shriman Bhagavatam exactly as he heard it from Shukdev Goswami and also realized it personally. Personal realization does not mean that one should, out of vanity, attempt to show one's own learning by trying to surpass the previous acharya. This is such an important mind. Personal realization does not mean that one should, out of vanity, attempt to show one's own learning by trying to surpass the previous acharya. He must have full confidence in the previous acharya. And at the same time, he must realize the subject matter so nicely that he can present the matter for the particular circumstances in a suitable manner. The original purpose of the text must be maintained. No obscure meaning should be screwed out of it, yet it should be presented in an interesting manner for the understanding of the audience. This is called realization. The leader of the assembly, Shona, could estimate the value of the speaker, Shri Sudh Goswami, simply by his uttering Yatha Dhitam and Yatha Mati, and therefore he was very glad to congratulate him in ecstasy. No learned man should be willing to hear a person who does not represent the original Acharya. So the speaker and the audience were bona fide in this meeting where Bhagavatam has been recited for the second time. That should be the standard of recitation of Bhagavatam, so that the real purpose can be served without difficulty. Unless this situation is created, Bhagavatam recitation for extraneous purposes is useless labor both for the speaker and for the audience. In this purport, Srila Prabhupada has given some very important points. One thing is speaking on Sriman or speaking on Krishna consciousness. So he says, personal realization means we speak the same message which has been given by the previous Acharyas, but in our own words. That is called personal realization. In a way, the audience can appreciate it. In a way, the audience can understand it. But not in a way that we change the message or we try to pass on this message that what I am trying to give you is something different from what has been given in the past and giving something new to you. It should be the same thing. However, present it in a way that it is relevant. This is only possible if a person has digested the knowledge sufficiently, has understood the knowledge sufficiently. One kind of representation is like that of a parrot. You hear and you just repeat. There is nothing wrong with that. That is much better than telling the wrong thing. Isn't it? it is much better to just repeat the right thing rather than telling the wrong thing. But much better than repeating like a parrot is, one should digest it, one should assimilate it, and then one should speak from one's realization, from one's heart. In a way that the people who are attending the class or listening to us can appreciate, can understand, can find it relevant. And how this is possible, I have spoken about this before also, and I'll repeat. When we go through the learning process, that we follow the three stages. First is Shavanam, second is Mananam, and the third is Nididhyasanam. Hearing, contemplating, ap applying, application. Then that knowledge turns into realization. First is you hear, second is you contemplate, third is you apply. So when you do that, then that knowledge turns into realization. And then when you speak it out, 
people will be able to understand you are speaking from your heart you are not speaking just from your memory you have realized it you are speaking from your heart so that's a very important point about personal realization and shri prabhupad says that because sudh goswami was speaking from his heart when shonak rishi heard sudh goswami he understood that sudh goswami is not speaking like a parrot right and when sudh goswami said i'll speak on shrimad bhagavatam now so shonak rishi stood up and congratulated yes very nice very nice go ahead we want to hear we want to hear and here certain qualities of uh, shonakrishi has been mentioned in the in the verse that he was a learned person he was elderly in the assembly and uh, that's why he congratulate let's go to the next verse verse number 2 shonaka uvacha so shonakrishi is now telling to sudh gosa what is he saying सूत सूत महाभाग बदनो वदतांबर तथा भागवती पुण्याम यथाह भगवान शुक शौनक से ओ सूत को स्वामी यू आर द मोस्ट फॉर्चुनेट and respected of all those who can speak and recite please relate the pious message of shrimad bhagavatam which was spoken by the great and powerful sage shukdev goswami please relate the powerful message of shrimad bhagavatam purport sud goswami is twice addressed here in by shona goswami out of great joy because he and the members of the assembly were eager to hear the text of bhagavatam uttered by shukdev goswami they were not interested in hearing it from a bogus person who would interpret in his own way to suit his own purpose generally the so called bhagavatam reciters are either professional readers professional readers means give them 20000 they will come to your house in 7 days they will recite the entire shrimad bhagavatam professional readers hmm. or so called learned impersonalist who cannot enter into the transcendental personal activities of the supreme person such impersonalists twist some meanings out of bhagavatam to suit and support impersonalist views and the professional readers at once go to the 10th canto to miss explain the most confidential part of the lost past times neither of these reciters are bona fide persons to recite bhagavatam only one was prepared to present bhagavatam in the light of shukdev goswami and only those who are prepared to hear shukdev goswami and his representative are bona fide participants in the transcendental discussion of shrimad bhagavatam very simple proper we go to the next one now begins the question so this is the first question you can mark shonagrishi is asking the first question to sudh goswami what is the question kasmin yuge pravritteyam sthane vage na hetuna kutah sanjodita krishnah kritvan sanhita muni kasmin kasmin means in which yuge pravrittayam sthane vake na hetuna so which all questions is asking in what period and at what place was this first begun right what is he is asking he is asking about the history of shrimad bhagavatam in which place and at what period so he is asking the time and he is asking the place that shrimad bhagavatam was first spoken and why was this taken up why did why did shrimad bhagavatam come into existence from where did krishna dwaipayana vyas the great sage get the inspiration to compile this literature okay ha huh? right 
So now you can understand how many questions are there here? Four questions. Shrimad Bhagavatam was spoken where first? At what time? Why it was spoken? And then one extra detail is given that Krishna Dwaita and Vyas, he compiled this scripture. So from where did he get the inspiration to compile this scripture? Isn't it? Right? Hmm? That has been asked. Okay. So, yes, Sanjay Prabhuji, you have something to say? Yes, Prabhu. You can unmute now, try. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Prabhuji, the first verse says Vyas Uvache. And Vyas is saying that Sudh Goswami speak thus. Yes. But Bhagavatam was written by Vyasdev after this episode was over or prior to that? Yeah, okay. Good question. The question is why uh, Vyasa Vacha has come there, right? So the thing is, Vyasa they first spoke Srimad Bhagavatam to Shukdev Goswami. Then Shukdev Goswami spoke it to Maharaj Pariksha. Right? Then in that assembly, there was Sudh Goswami who heard from Shukdev Goswami and then Sudh Goswami spoke it to the sages at Naimishana. Vyas, they recorded that into book. Vyas, they recorded that into the book. The third one, which was spoken by Sudh Goswami to the sages at Naimishalene, that was recorded. That was compiled, put together. So one may say, why I like this? So it is very simple. You see, sometimes the author begins a work and then, you know, later on adds appendices to it. That's not correct. Uh, that you start with something and then later on you remember maybe this chapter should also go in or I forgot to add this. So it was started by Vyasadev and then things were later on added into it. Added into it. And then this is the final edition. Got it? That's the final edition. So uh, we, we go to now text 3, purport. What is the purport of that small, simple purport? Because Srimad Bhagavatam is the special contribution of Srila Vyasade, there are so many inquiries by the learned Shanaka. It was known to them that Srila Vyasade had already explained the text of the Vedas in various ways up to the Mahabharata. For the understanding of less intelligent women, shudras and fallen members of the family of Christ born men. Srimad Bhagavatam is transcendental to all of them because it has nothing to do with anything mundane. So the inquiries are very intelligent and relevant. Next. Now, four questions already asked. Now, next question. Uh, a prelude to that question. Text number four. Tasya Putro Maha Yogi. When you say Tasya, Tasya means what? His. His means whose? Vyasa Devs, right? So he's talking about himself. Tasya means Shanakrishi is talking about Vyasa Devs. Tasya Putro Maha Yogi. Samadrik Nirvikal Pakaha. Ekantamati Punitro. Guru Mulai Veyate. His son was a great devotee. Whose son, Vyasadev's son, was a great devotee. An equibalanced monist, whose mind was always concentrated in monism. He was transcendental to mundane activities, but being unexposed, he appeared like an ignorant person. So now a brief background of what kind of a person Sukhdev Goswami was, is being given by Shonakrishi. Why is Shonakrishi giving this background to us? Because later on, Shonakrishi will ask some question. There is a confusion in the mind of Shonakrishi. That's why he's giving this background. You know, what is he saying? That his son is already a great devotee. And his son is a monist. 
Okay, this is the background. So when we read the next verses, you will come to understand what is trying to say. Shila Shuddev Goswami was a liberated soul, and thus he remained always alert not to be trapped by the illusory energy. Now this one line is such an important line. Shila Sudhir Goswami was a liberated soul, and thus he remained always alert, not to be trapped by the illusory energy. I will ask you now, whoever is attending this class, to take one minute to read this line again and again, and try to understand what is the meaning of this line. So what do you understand by this one line? Any thoughts? Kanna Tanga Chaitanya Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu Ji, Dandvat Pranam. Prabhu Ji, condition soul or the person who is material stick cannot understand the activities of a spiritual person, but a spiritual the person who is completely engaged into the spiritual activity, he knows about the mood and the activity of a material stick person. For that one line, Prabhu, or you're talking about something else? Just one line, Prabhu. The first three or four lines, what is there mentioned? Okay. <laughs> Shuddev Goswami was a liberated soul, and thus he remained always alert <laughs> by the illusory emotion. Just that one line. What does that one line mean? What does that one line mean? See, Srila Prabhupada's purpose, they have such important instructions for us. This one line, we can have one hour discussion just on this one line. When you say someone is a liberated soul, it means what? That person is not affected by the three modes of material nature. So now, where is the question of that person being trapped in Maya? And here Prabhupada is saying that Srila Sukhdev Goswami was a liberated soul and thus he remained always alert not to be trapped by the illusory energy. Which means what? Which means that even when one has become a liberated soul, there is a chance to be trapped by the illusory energy. Right? If there is no chance to be trapped by the illusory energy, then where is the question of being alert? Are you able to understand? Is there a question of being alert then? No. Right? So that means there is a chance of being trapped by the illusory energy. Right? Which means what? Which means this, that by doing sadhana, we come to one level of spiritual realization. If we don't put efforts to remain on that level of spiritual realization, there are always chances to fall down. If you don't put efforts to maintain what you have, there are always chances to fall down. Like giving you an example. If one has fallen in a well, a deep dark well, okay, and you go to help that person, to rescue that person, you throw a rope down into the well. And then you tell that person, you climb using the rope. If that person has put efforts 
and climb 50 meters high. Has come up 50 meters high. You know. But after coming up 50 meters high, if that person leaves the rope, what will happen? Again, fall down. So that person has to still catch the rope, though that person has climbed 50 meters high. Likewise, in spiritual life, by doing sadhana, by following four regulatory principles, we make progress. There is increment in sattva guna. But we have to maintain that sattva guna. If we don't maintain that sattva guna and we get affected by rajo guna and tamo guna, we will come down. We will not stay where we are. And another important point to learn here. Sometimes, because this is the mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, this is the this is the path of Kripa. When we call, when we talk about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's line, we should know one thing: that in the line of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the progress that devotees make is because of Kripa, mercy. Not so much because of sadhana. Our sadhana is very bad, very poor sadhana. It's the mercy of the Acharyas, the Vaishnavas, that we make progress. Though we are not qualified, we get initiation. Though we are not qualified, we are made into pujaris. Though we are not qualified, we become preachers. Though we are not qualified, someone becomes Brahmachari. Though one is not qualified, someone can also become sannyasi. Though not qualified, someone can also be made into a guru, whatever may be. If you look at the required qualification in Kali Yuga, no one can have the required qualification. So what is done is, a chance is given. You take the opportunity and then you become qualified. Right? Isn't it? You take the opportunity and you become qualified. Slowly, slowly, the process will make you qualified. You'll become pure and you'll become qualified. So what happens is, please try to understand. When we are not qualified, the Acharyas, they invest into our spiritual life and make us qualified. They invest into our spiritual life and make us qualified. But after they have made the investment, then they will tell us, now it is your duty to maintain this investment. Now it is your duty to maintain it. It's just like, I'll give you an example. If you cannot lift a weight of 50 kilograms, I'll tell you, I'll help you to lift it up. But after I have given it to you, you have to catch hold of it. And this has to be understood. I might not be qualified to, to practice Krishna consciousness at a certain level. So the spiritual master, the bona fide Vaishnavas, they will empower us. They will bless us. They will give the mercy to us. But then they expect also, after the mercy has been given, we become qualified to maintain that mercy. And if you are not, if you don't do that, by becoming little, uh, what do you say, careless, if we lose that attention, alertness, Maya will catch us. Maya will catch us. This is very important for us to understand. This one line, Prabhupada says here, that Shukdev Goswami was a liberated soul, so he was very alert to not be trapped by the illusory energy. Likewise in Kali Yuga, the Vaishnava should be very alert not to be Again, a victim of Kali. 
by the mercy of Vaishnavas, we have been removed from the influence of Kali. We have been taken out from the influence of Kali. So we have to be very careful that we don't become a victim of that again. Not to be trapped by it again. Chances are always there. Always there. But one has to be alert. Alert. To protect oneself from that. That we have to do. And sometimes it happens we become careless and we become a victim of it. And then the Vaishnavas, they again pull us out of that. Again, they will, you know, help us, pull us out of that situation. But that will not go forever. It will not go forever. So, one has to then learn oneself how to remain alert. This is very nice. Once Prabhupada uh, was praying to the deities, so Tamal Krishna Maharaj asked him, what are you praying, Shita Prabhupada? And Prabhupada said, I am praying to Lord Krishna that I never should fall down in Maya. I am praying to Krishna that please protect me. I should never fall down in Maya again. So a Vaishnava has to remain alert to this, that the chances of fall down are always there. Always there. Always, always there. And we have to be very attentive that we don't become like that. Because when we do that, it's just like you came up by the help of someone and then you did not pay attention, so you fell down. And then Vaishnavas will again pull us up and then if you are not attentive, then you fall down. So if, if that happens again and again in our life, will we be able to make tangible progress? No. You know, you go up and then come down, go up and come down, go up and come down, go up and come down. You don't, you don't make progress, sufficient progress. Reading further. Further it is written in the Bhagavad. In the Bhagavad Gita, this alertness is very lucidly explained. Again, in the Bhagavad Gita, this alertness is very lucidly explained. You want to know in which chapter it is explained? Then it is explained in chapter number 5. The whole chapter 5 is about this. How a person should be alert in Krishna consciousness. The liberated soul and the conditioned soul have different engagements. The liberated soul is always engaged in the progressive path of spiritual attainment, which is something like a dream for the conditioned soul. The conditioned soul cannot imagine the actual engagements of the liberated soul. While the conditioned soul thus dreams about spiritual engagements, the liberated soul is awake. Similarly, the engagement of a conditioned soul appears to be a dream for the liberated soul. A conditioned soul and a liberated soul may apparently be on the same platform, but factually they are differently engaged and their attention is always alert, either in sense enjoyment or in self-realization. The conditioned soul is absorbed in matter, whereas the liberated soul is completely indifferent to matter. This indifference is explained as follows. Indifference to matter. Okay, next verse. Verse number five. Verse number five is Drishtva Nuyantam Rishmatma Champapya Nagnam Devyo Hiya Paridatu Nasutas Chitram Tadviksha Prichati Muno Jagatus Tabasti while Sri Vyasadeva was following his son, beautiful young damsels who were bathing naked covered their bodies with clothes. Although Sri Vyasadeva himself was not naked, but they had not done so when his son had passed. The sage inquired about this, and the young ladies replied that his son was purified and when looking at them, made no distinction between male and female. 
but the sage made such distinctions. Go to the previous verse. You see, what is the last line in the purport? This indifference is explained as follows. The word is indifference. Indifference. Huh? And what is that indifference? Is explained in verse number five. What is that? What is that explanation? The explanation is this. When Shuddev Goswami was born, immediately he left the home and went into the forest. And you will come to know this story later in Shumatma That Shuddev Goswami was born not as a baby. He was born as a 16-year-old boy. <laughs> you know, he was so huge when he came out of the mother's womb. 16-year-old boy. So, as soon as he was born, he just left the home and started walking into the forest. So, Vyasade was running after him. My dear son, come back, come back. You know, we have not done anything for you. We have not given you a name. We have not done any kind of sanskar for you. Come back. We have to take education also. Right. But this boy was walking. And Vyasade was walking behind. So when they were going like this, the son was walking and the father was walking behind. Nearby, there was a lake and in that lake, ladies were taking bath. So they had not worn any clothes. They were without any clothes. So when Shuddev Goswami walked from there, he was 16 year old, which means a young boy and he was naked, not wearing any clothes. So the ladies, they did not bother. They did not pay attention. They saw the boys going, no problem. But when the sage Vyasa they walked from there, he was having white beard. He was old man at that time. And the ladies immediately they covered their body with the cloth. So what will happen is very easily understandable. Vyasa they question, Are, my young son, he is naked and he is walking and you don't cover your body. And I am old man and I am fully dressed up. You are like my daughters. And when you see me, you cover your body. Why so? So it's explained here. It's explained in the translation. The sage inquired about this and the young ladies replied that his son was purified. And when looking at them, made no distinction between man and woman, male and female. But the sage made such distinctions. So what we understand here, when a person becomes liberated soul, then a person does not see the body. When a person becomes a liberated soul, the person does not see the body. That this is man's body, this is woman's body. What does that person see? Atma, spirit, soul. Man or woman, it is just a dress. The person is basically spirit, soul. So this is called the vision of a liberated soul. But a conditioned soul will see the body. Only the external body. But a liberated soul will not see the body. So the ladies could see that. Now, when we read the purport, we'll understand. In the Bhagavad Gita 5.18, it is said that a learned sage looks equally on a learned and gentle brahmana, a chandala, a dog, or a cow, due to his spiritual vision. Srila Shuddev Goswami attained that stage. Thus, he did not see a male or female. He saw all living entities in different dress. The ladies who were bathing could understand the mind of a man simply by studying his demeanor. Just as by looking at a child, one can understand how innocent he is. Shuddev Goswami was a young boy, 16 years old, and therefore all the parts of his body were developed. He was naked also, and so were the ladies. But because Shuddev Goswami was transcendental to sex relationship, he appeared very innocent. The ladies, by their special qualification, could sense this at once, and therefore they were not very concerned about him. 
But when his father passed, the ladies quickly dressed. The ladies were exactly like his children or grandchildren. Yet they reacted to the presence of Vyasadeva according to the social custom because Srila Vyasadeva played the part of a householder. A householder has to distinguish between male and female. Otherwise, he cannot be a household. One should therefore attempt to know the distinction between body and soul without any attachment for male and female. Now, this is again an important line. One should try to know the difference between body and soul without attachment to male and female. One should know the difference between body and soul without attachment for male and female. Understand the difference between body and soul. As long as such distinction is there, one should not try to become a sannyasi like Shukdev Goswami. At there, one should not, at, at least theoretically, one must be convinced that a living entity is neither male nor female. Theoretically, at least theoretically, we should know. The outward dress is made up of matter by material nature to attract the opposite sex and thus keep one entangled in material existence. A liberated soul is above this perverted distinction. He does not distinguish between one living being and another. For him, they are all one and the same spirit. The perfection of the spiritual vision is the liberated stage. And Srila Shukdev Goswami attained that stage. Srila Vyasadeva was also in the transcendental stage. But because he was in the householder's life, he did not pretend to be a liberated soul as a matter of custom. Here, both Shukdev Goswami and Vyasadeva are liberated souls. Shukdev Goswami is a great devotee. And who is Vyasadeva? He is himself incarnation of the Supreme Lord. Right? We studied in the previous chapter. Vyasadeva is an incarnation of the Supreme Lord. So can Vyasadeva be impure? No. He is also completely pure. He is also a liberated soul. Shukdev Goswami is also a liberated soul. But though Vyasadeva is a liberated soul, he is acting as a Grihastha. He is acting as a a family man. And because he's acting as a family man, just to teach people, he's following some rules and regulations as a matter of custom. Right? So this happens. Sometimes, for preaching purpose, a person can come to a position lower than the actual position. For preaching purpose. Coming to a position lower than the actual position. Like Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada is a Vaishnava of the highest caliber. But for preaching purpose, he came down. For preaching purpose, he came down. For preaching purpose, he personally you know, married his disciples. For preaching purpose. For preaching purpose, he cooked for people. For preaching purpose, He's, he discussed basic philosophy with people. Not that he is a Vaishnava of that level. He is a Vaishnava of highest level. But coming down to a lower level. So like that Vyasadeva is acting as a householder. So he is behaving like a householder. But he is also a liberated soul. Shukdev Goswami is a liberated soul acting as a liberated soul. Paramahamsa. Yeah, Paramahamsa. Next verse. Now comes the question. What is the question? Kathamalikshutah paurehe sampraptah kuru jangalan unmadda mukha jadavada vicharan gaja sahabaye. How was he, Shukde Kusami, the son of Yasa? Recognized by the citizens when he entered the city of Hastinapur, now Delhi. After wandering in the provinces of Kuru and Jangada, appearing like a madman, dumb and retarded. 
So you see the sage, the sage Shonaka is asking a very interesting question. The question is, he knows Shuddev Goswami spoke Shrimad Bhagavad to Parikshit Maharaj. He knows that. But he knows Shuddev Goswami was not a person who used to travel everywhere with a big entourage, 50 people following him, you know, doing band baja. This is Shuddev Goswami, Shuddev Goswami ki jai, nothing like that. He was traveling around like a madman, Pagal Vikti, all alone, not wearing clothes also. So Shonaka is thinking, how is it that this person met Parikshit Maharaj? Who brought them together? How did this meeting happen? Because Shuddev Goswami was not someone who was like, you know, known that, okay, this person is there, there's a secretary to this person and you can approach him, this is the address. No, he was just roaming around. And suddenly it so happens, he comes to meet Parikshit Maharaj. How did this happen? How did they identify? This is the question that he is asking. This is like a coincidence. How did this happen? So, purpose. The present city of Delhi was formerly known as Hastinapur because it was established by King Hasti. Goswami Sukhdev, after leaving his paternal home, was roaming like a madman. And therefore, it was very difficult for the citizens to recognize him in his exalted position. A sage is not therefore recognized by sight, but by hearing. One should approach a sadhu, a great sage, not to see, but to hear. If one is not prepared to hear the words of a sadhu, there is no prophet. Shuddev Goswami was a sadhu who could speak on the transcendental activities of the Lord. He did not satisfy the whims of ordinary citizens. He was recognized when he spoke on the subject of Bhagavata. He never attempted jugglery like a magician. Outwardly, he appeared to be a retarded, dumb, madman, but in fact, he was the most elevated transcendental personality. Nowadays, it has become a fashion. People, those who know, they speak on any subject matter. And they think it is glorious to talk on any subject matter. But people who are actually learned, they don't waste their words on any subject matter. They will only talk what is supposed to be spoken. Right? So, here, Shuddev Goswami, if he would go and meet ordinary people, he would not talk at all. Why? Because what he will talk, they will not understand. They will not understand. But when he got the chance to speak to Maharaj Parikshit, then he spoke Srimad Bhagavad. He spoke Srimad Bhagavad. So it's not that because someone can speak on any subject matter that makes that person very learned. The main thing is that what subject matter you're talking about, what is the level of that subject matter? That is the main thing. So Shuddev Goswami, for ordinary people, he was a crazy person. He did not know anything. But when he came in the assembly of sages, then he spoke very learned things. He spoke Srimad Bhagavata. This is how people are identified. Next verse. Katamba Pandave Yasya Raja Rishir Muninasaha Sambada Samabhutata Yatraisha Satvati Shutihi. How did it so happen that King Parikshit met, met this great? Sage. Now, this is such an important question. How is it that Parikshit Maharaj met this sage? Because interestingly, Parikshit Maharaj did not go to Shukdev Goswami. Parikshit Maharaj went to the bank of the Ganges. And he sat there. That I will die. I will not eat. I will not drink. I will die. He did not go to Shukdev Goswami that my dear spiritual master, please give me knowledge. No, he did not do it. Right? 
So the sage, the sage is asking, how did they meet? What made them meet? What made them come together? Making it possible for this great transcendental essence of the Vedas, Bhagavatam to be sung to him. So what made them meet? Who made them meet? Paramatma made them meet. Providence made them meet. When a person, a sincere person, is eager to get true sadhu sangha, then Krishna arranges for that sadhu sangha. When a devotee wants to get real sadhu sangha, so that the devotee can become a better devotee of Krishna, then it is Krishna who arranges such sadhu sangha. Because Parikshit Maharaj wanted to get the association of a genuine sadhu, Krishna sent genuine sadhu to Parikshit Maharaj. This is how it happens. For people say, I cannot find a bona fide guru. To find a bona fide guru, one doesn't have to go to the Himalayas. One doesn't have to go to the caves. One has to only go inside one's own heart and look, why do I want to associate with the Sadhguru? When in our own heart, we'll find genuine reason to associate with the Sadhu, then Sadhu will come to our doorstep. Krishna will send. Krishna will send. Did the hippies come to Prabhupada or did Prabhupada go to meet the hippies? He went to America. He went to New York. He met the hippies there. So many examples. Huh? Did Prahlad Maharaj go to Narad Muni or Narad Muni came to? Narad Muni came to Pralad. He rescued the mother of Pralad from Indra and said, you leave her with me. I'll take care of her. It is Narad who met Dhruv Maharaj, not Dhruv Maharaj who met Narad. It is here in Srimad Bhagavatam, now we'll study. It is Narad who comes to Vyasa, not Vyasa goes to Narad. So whenever in the heart of a conditioned soul, there is a genuine inquiry and a genuine desire to associate with true sadhus, Krishna will arrange for sadhu sangha. Krishna will do that. So if someone says, I don't have association of devotees, that means there is something wrong in my own, my own life. If I have desire for association of devotees, Krishna will arrange the association. So here, Shonak is saying, how did they meet? What happened? Hmm? Srimad Bhagavatam is stated here as the essence of the Vedas. It is not an imaginary story as it is sometimes considered by unauthorized men. It is also called Shuka Samhita or the Vedic hymn spoken by Sri Shukadev Goswami. The great liberated sage. Text 8. Now, another very interesting question is coming. Sa go do hana matram hi griheshu grihame dina avakshate mahabhagas tirthi kurvam san ashranam. He's saying what? Very beautifully, he's saying that sa go do hana matram hi. He's saying that this, this sage, Shukde Goswami, he he was accustomed to stay at the door of a householder only long enough for a cow to be milked. Go dohana. How much time it takes to milk a cow? Maybe 15-20 minutes, half an hour maximum. So he would just stay only for that much time. And he did this just to sanctify the residence. He would just do this much. So why is Shonagris is saying this? Shonagris is saying that this person, he cannot stay more than 30 minutes at one place. How did he stay at one place for seven days? 
How did he stay at one place for seven days? He does not stay at one place for more than thirty minutes. What made him stay in one place for seven days and speak the whole Shrimad Bhagavatam? Right? And then one may say, "Oh, he does not stay for more than thirty minutes because all these householders they are sense gratifiers. He doesn't want to stay with them." You know? So that's why he doesn't stay more than thirty minutes. So one may say, "But Parikshit Maharaj was the king." He is the biggest sense gratifier. Huh? He is the king. So when you say king, means what? Bigger sense, biggest sense gratifier. No, so many queens, so much of wealth, so many servants. Biggest sense gratifier. So why is he then spending seven days with such a big sense gratifier? Right. So Shona Krishna is asking these questions. What made him stay for such long with Parikshit Maharaj? What happened? Why did Shudhir Goswami spend so much time there? Lead the purport. Shukdev Goswami met Emperor Parikshit and explained the text of Shrimad Bhagavatam. He was not accustomed to stay at any householder's residence for more than half an hour at the time of milking the cow, and he would just take alms from the fortunate householder. That was to sanctify the residence by his auspicious presence. Therefore, Shukdev Goswami is an ideal preacher established in the transcendental. Position. From his activities, those who are in the renounced order of life and dedicated to the mission of preaching the message of God should learn that they have no business with householders, save and except to enlighten them in transcendental knowledge. Such asking for alms from the householder should be for the purpose of sanctifying his home. One who is in the renounced order of life should not be allured by the glamour of the. Householders' worldly possessions and thus become subservient to worldly men. For one who is in the renounced order of life, this is more dangerous than drinking poison and committing suicide. So this is a very heavy instruction for those who are in sannyas ashram. That sannyasis they should not become beggars. It's not that. Because I could not get sense gratification, I should become a sannyasi and then borrow money from people and then get sense success. That is not the reason. That is not the purpose to become a sannyasi. In India, sometimes it happens like that. That let me become a guru, then I have very rich chelas disciples, and then those rich disciples will give me a big car, you know, big house. And nice prasada, and lot of dakshina, and in this way I can become a very happy, you know, enjoy my life. So this is not the right standard of sannyas. Sannyas means a life of renunciation, and that renunciation should be natural. That renunciation should be based on two things: knowledge and devotion. Renunciation based on knowledge and devotion. Not artificial, natural, because of spiritual knowledge and because of devotion for Krishna. So that renunciation should be there, and out of that renunciation, they should accept services from householders for their purification. This should this should become a standard. Not that. One should go to the house of the householder to eat nice paneer sabji and sweets, you know. And this is how uh, a renounced person should enjoy life. You no, know? should not, should not. So it's it's very important. Once our spiritual master told us that. If a devotee invites you to house for prasada, don't just go and eat there. Go and do some Krishna katha. Don't just go and eat. And just go and eat prasada. No, go and give something. Do Krishna katha. Do Krishna kirtan. That is the best way of doing sangas. That is the best way of doing sangha. Krishna katha and Krishna kirtan. Not just go and eat nice. 
and this is how also the householder should be. They should not just invite sadhus to feed them. Invite sadhus to hear from them, to do Krishna katha and Krishna kirtan. Not just feed them prasada. Do both, right? Because if we are only interested in feeding prasadam to sadhus, then our mentality is of like a karma kandi brahmana mentality. Like a karma kandi person does. Invite brahmanas to the house, feed them prasadam, I'll get some punya. Finish. But Vaishnavas are not interested in punya. Are Vaishnavas interested in punya? No, Vaishnavas are interested in bhakti. Right? So, the, those who are going to the house of a householder, they should make a point that they don't just go for eating. And those who are inviting also to house, they should make a point that they too should not just invite for feeding. They should be Krishna Katha, Krishna Kirtan, right? Sometimes it so happens that those who invite devotees to the house, they will do everything, make nice arrangement, give prasada, give dakshina also, but there is no time to sit and talk. There is no time to sit and hear about Krishna. That is very wrong, very, very, very bad. For when we say devotee association or sadhu sangha, the best way of sangha is hearing. There is nothing better than that. Is nothing better than that. So we should do that. We should know that. And we should make that as a policy. Right? That when, when devotees come to our house, there should be Krishna Katha, Krishna Kirtan and Krishna Prasada. Then it is complete. Not, not just Prasada. Not just Prasada. It should be complete. Okay. Reading further now. Text number nine. What is the text? Abhimanyu sutam suta prahur bhagavato tamam tasya janma mahascharyam karmani chagrini hinaha. It is said that Maharaj Parikshit is a great first class devotee of the Lord. And that his birth and activities are all wonderful. Please tell us about him. This is the third question. What is it? Maharaj Parikshit is a great devotee and his activities and birth are all wonderful. You please tell us about his birth and activities. Huh? So where will he, where will the answer come to this question? It will come in chapter number seven. It will start coming in chapter number seven. And while Sudh Goswami will give the answer to this, he will get distracted. Means he will forget that I started here. He'll start talking about different, different things. And then the sages will remind him, my dear sir, you forgot. This was our question. Come back to the topic. So then Sudh Goswami will come back to that topic and start describing this again in chapter 12, 13, 14. He starts in chapter 7, gets distracted. Chapter 8 gone, 9 gone, 10 gone, 11 gone. Then they remind, come back please. So then he goes back to chapter 12. Starts telling the same thing again. Births and activities of Parikshit. Told in chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, so on. Okay. So this is the next question. Please tell us about him. Uh, the birth of Maharaj Parikshit is wonderful. Because in the womb of his mother, he was protected by the personality of God. It's Shri Krishna. His activities are also wonderful. Because he chastised Kali, who was attempting to kill a cow. To kill cow means to end human civilization. He wanted to protect the cow from being killed by the great representative of sin. His death is also wonderful because he got previous notice of his death. Isn't it? Very special case. Got a previous notice. Which is wonderful for any mortal being. And thus he prepared himself for passing away by sitting down on the back of the Ganges and hearing the transcendental activities of the Lord. During all the days he heard Bhagavatam. He did not take food or drink, nor did he sleep a moment. 
So everything about him is wonderful, and his activities are worth hearing attentively. Desire is expressed hearing to hear about him. Such a nice explanation by Prabhupada. His birth is wonderful. His death is wonderful. Seven days fasting is wonderful. Everything is wonderful. Next verse. Now, what is the question? The next question. The next question is verse number ten. Sa samrat kasse bahe to pandu nama navardhana prayo pavishta ganga ya. He was a great emperor and possessed all the opulences of his acquired kingdom. He was so exalted that he was increasing the prestige of the Pandu dynasty. Why did he give up everything to sit down on the bank of the Ganges and fast until death? Shonak is asking a very good question. You see, simple, simple logic. Why should someone take sannyas? Why? What could be the reason? Had a fight with the wife, so take sannyas. Right. Or the children, they pet him with the shoes. Old fellow doing nothing, take sannyas, isn't it? Or had a loss, ten crores lost in a business, take sannyas. So generally, generally the desire to give up comes when when there is frustration, right? Otherwise, who will give up? Generally, why people give up when there is frustration? I could not fulfill my desire, so let me give up. So what Shonak is saying? He was a young man. He was a young man, and he was very successful. He was a young man, very successful, powerful king, had so much of wealth. Everyone was listening to him. Why is he giving up? Are you able to understand the question? What Shonak is asking? Parikshit is not an old man. Parikshit is not an old man. He is a young man. He is not poor. He is rich. No voice. No voice. Are you not able to hear me? Can hear. Okay. Okay, Prabhu. Can hear. Prabhu ji, we can hear. So you see, Parikshit is not old; he is young. Parikshit is not poor; he is rich. Parikshit is not powerless; he is powerful. Right? Parikshit has so many, so much of control. So he has all the reasons to continue to rule the kingdom. Should they be saying? Shonak is saying, why is he giving up such a powerful kingdom? Why? What is the reason to give up? He is a young man, and more than that, now you may say, but Maya, no, Maya is very strong. One should take sannyas as soon as you get opportunity. Take sannyas. Maya is very strong. So. For that, Shonak is saying, but he's a devotee. Devotee means you are free from Maya, right? A devotee, a devotee means transcendental in all situations. So why is he giving up? Are you able to understand the question of Shonak? He is a devotee. Devotee means what? Whether you are in heaven or hell, you are a sannyasi, you are a grihastha, you are rich, you are poor, you are a devotee. It doesn't matter. You use everything in Krishna seva. So why is he giving up? What is the reason? Maharaj Parikshit was the emperor of the world. Prabhupada is explaining. Maharaj Parikshit was the emperor of the world and all the seas and oceans. And he did not have to take the trouble to acquire such a kingdom by his own effort. He inherited it from his grandfather's Maharaj Yudhishthir and brothers. Besides that, he is doing well in the administration and was worthy of the good names of his forefathers. Consequently, there was nothing undesirable in his opulence and administration. Then why should he give up all these unfavorable circumstances and sit down on the bank, all these favorable circumstances, and sit down on the bank of the Ganges? Fasting till death. This is astonishing. 
and therefore all were eager to know the cause. Hmm? There was no reason to give a bachelor, but still he gave up. So this was astonished. That why? Why did you give up? Why you should? Why you should continue to be the king? Continue to you know do your responsibilities. Next verse. Shivaya lokasya. No, no, sorry. Text eleven. Namandiyat pada niketa matmana ha. Shivaya haniyat nani shatta bha. Katham sabira shiyamanga dusya cha. Yuvai shato. Shastum mahusa suhi. He was such a great emperor that all his enemies would come and bow down at his feet and surrender all their wealth for their own benefit. He was full of youth and strength, and he possessed insuperable kingly opulences. Why did he want to give up everything, including his life? They are not able to understand a young man, not an old man. Young man, why is he giving up? Why? There was nothing undesirable in his life. He was quite a young man and could enjoy life with power and opulence. So there was no question of retiring from active life. There was no difficulty in collecting the state taxes because he was so powerful and chivalrous that even his enemies would come to him and bow down at his feet and surrender all wealth for their own benefit. Maharaj Parikshit was a pious king. There was he conquered his enemies and therefore the kingdom was full of prosperity. There was enough milk, grains, and metals, and all the rivers and mountains were full of potency. So materially, everything was satisfactory. Therefore, there was no question of untimely giving up his kingdom and life. The sages were eager to hear about all this. Text twelve. Shiva ya lokasya bhava ya bhutaye ya uttam shloka parayana jana. जीवंतिनाथमर्थमसोपराशयोजनिर्विद्यपुतकलेवरमोचनिर्विद्यपुतकलेवरम दोषा A pure devotee of Krishna does not live for oneself; he lives for others, right? Now, if you are living for others, why you should give your life? If you are living for yourself, then you should give your life. But if you are living for others, then you should use your life in serving others. So, if he is a devotee and he is living for others, why is he giving up his life? His life is for the welfare, development, and happiness of others. They do not live for any selfish interest. So, even though the emperor was free from all attachment to worldly possessions, how could he give up his mortal body, which was shelter for? You see, the kind of questions Shanagrishi is asking are amazing questions, very thoughtful questions. That a person may think, "Sansar is Maya. Let me leave Maya. I'll get Krishna." But then, Sansar is not Maya for a pure devotee of Krishna, because he uses Sansar and Krishna seva. So how can it be Maya, right? So Shona is saying, if Parikshit is a pure devotee, then how can he leave the kingdom as Maya? If he's a pure devotee. and how can he leave his responsibility as a king calling it as maya then everything is for krishna's pleasure right so how can he do that why is he doing that so such nice arguments are being posed here parishit maharaj was an ideal king and householder because he was a devotee of the lord a devotee of the lord automatically has all good qualifications and the emperor was a typical example of this personally he had no attachment for all the worldly opulences in his position but since he was king for the all round welfare of his citizens he was always busy in the welfare work of the public not only for this life but also for the next 
He would not allow slaughterhouses or killing of cows. He was not a foolish and partial administrator who would arrange for the protection of one living being and allow another to be killed. Because he was a devotee of the Lord, he knew perfectly well how to conduct his administration for everyone's happiness, men, animals, plants, and all living creatures. He was not selfishly centered. Selfishness is either self-centered or self-extended. He was neither. His interest was to please the supreme truth, personality of God. The king is the representative of the supreme God, and therefore the king's interest must be identical with that of the supreme Lord. The supreme Lord wants all living beings to be obedient to him and thereby become happy. Therefore, the king's interest is to guide all subjects back to the kingdom of God. Hence, the activities of the citizens should be so coordinated that they can at the end go back home, back to God. Under the administration of a representative king, the kingdom is full of opulence. At that time, human beings need not eat animals. There are ample food, grains, milk, fruit and vegetables, so that the human beings as well as the animals can eat sumptuously and to their heart's content. If all living beings are satisfied with food and shelter and obey the prescribed rules, there cannot be any disturbance between one living being and another. But Emperor Parikshit was a worthy king and therefore all were happy during this reign. Last verse for today. Tat sarvam na samashakshva prishto yadhi ha kinshana manyatvam vishaye vacham snata manyatra chandasa so this is verse number 13 of chapter 4. Shonagrishi is saying, We know that you are expert in the meaning of all subjects, except some portions of the Vedas. And thus you can clearly explain the answers to all the questions we have just put to you. So now he has put some questions, right? So he's saying you can answer all of them because you are learned in almost all the sections of the Vedas. Okay. Now, Prabhupada then mentioned something very important in the purport. Please read it attentively. The difference between the Vedas and the Puranas is like that between the Brahmanas and the Parivrajanas. So, there are two things mentioned here. First is the Brahmanas and the other is the Parivrajanas. The Brahmanas are meant to administer some fruitive sacrifices mentioned in the Vedas. But the Parivrajaka charges are learned preachers are meant to disseminate transcendental knowledge to one another. Now this is such an important thing. You see, being a Brahmana and being a preacher of Krishna consciousness are two different things. Right? Being a Brahmana means what? I am a Pujari. I know how to do some Yajyas. I know how to chant some Mantras. But I don't know how to inspire people to take to Krishna consciousness. These are two different things. In India, those who come from the cultural background of, you know, Brahmanical lifestyle, they, they are very orthodox in terms of what can be done, what cannot be done. This is to be done in this way. This cannot be done like this, like that. Too much into rules and regulations. But then they forget the essence. The essence is what? The essence of all the rules and regulations is always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. Right? That's the essence. So those people, they don't become into good preachers. Why? Because their thinking is very stereotyped. Limited thinking, narrow thinking. They will think Krishna can be worshipped in a particular way only. They will think a song can be sung in a particular way only. Anything can be done in a particular way only. And because of that, they are not able to reach out to many and connect them to Krishna. But Parivrajaka Acharyas are different. They know that the goal of any living entity is to have a relationship and they'll try to help that person establish that relationship. Srila Prabhupada was a Parivarajka Acharya. He saw how can this person be connected to Krishna. 
but many of his god brothers they were not with that mood they were like no no you cannot give diksha to a western person no you cannot make a mother ji into a brahmana no you cannot do this no you cannot do that the prabhupad did not see that he saw how can this person be connected to krishna right so the, that difference prabhupad is going to now again further explain here as such parivrajita acharyas are not always expert in pronouncing the vedic mantras right which are practiced systematically by accent and meter by the brahmanas who are meant for administering vedic rites yet it should not be considered that the brahmanas are more important than the itinerant preachers they are one and different simultaneously because they are meant for the same and in different ways right so like i tell you something very interesting there are many devotees in his con who have never done bhakti vaibhav or bhakti shastra right but they have made thousands of people into devotees <laughs> but there are people in this con who have done bhakti shastri bhakti vaibhav but perhaps they have not made even one person into a devotee <laughs> right there are people like that uh, done bhakti shastri bhakti vaibhav but they have not made any one into a devotee but there are devotees who have not done bhakti shastri but they have made thousands of people into devotees so that is the difference of being between a brahmana and a parivrajika acharya right one thing is that one knows the things theoretically the other thing is that one knows how to apply it apply it. so having spiritual knowledge is one thing but then using that spiritual knowledge to bring transformation in others lives that is a different that is another thing. right that is another thing. so leading further there is no difference also between the vedic mantras and what is explained in the puranas and itihas according to shri jeev goswami it is mentioned in the madhyam dina shruti that all the vedas namely the sam atharva rig yajur puranas itihasas upanishads etc are emanations from the breathing of the supreme being the only difference is that the vedic mantras are mostly begun with pranava omkar and it requires some training to practice the metric pronunciation of the vedic mantras but that does not mean that shrimad bhagavatam is of less importance than the vedic mantras on the contrary it is the ripened fruit of all the vedas as stated before besides that the most perfectly liberated soul shri the shukdev goswami is absorbed in the studies of the bhagavatam although he is already self realized shri the sud goswami is following his footsteps and therefore his position is not the least less important because he was not expert in chanting vedic mantras with metric pronunciation which depends more on practice than actual realization realization is more important than parrot like chanting realization is more important so anyone who has realization will preach krishna consciousness one doesn't have to become a bhakti shastri to preach krishna consciousness one doesn't have to become a bhakti vaibhav to preach krishna consciousness if your heart is brimming with the joy that comes from krishna consciousness you will preach krishna consciousness if your heart is brimming with the joy of krishna consciousness then i'll share krishna consciousness naturally it will happen naturally not that it has to be told or it has to be artificially done so prabhupad prabhupad always told his uh, followers way to become a pure devotee to share krishna consciousness with others if you are tasting the sweetness of it just go out and share that sweetness with others if you are tasting the sweetness of it, and just go out and share that sweetness with others right so that is the difference between a parivrajika acharya and a brahmana a brahmana is oh my mantra should be perfect 
my knowledge should be perfect, my this should be perfect, my that should be perfect, then I'll become a teacher. Or then I'll say Krishna consciousness with others. No, we don't have to wait for that. If we have taken the essence, the essence is what? The essence is, this world is a blazing fire. Place. Full of blazing fire. And those who are not devotees, they are getting burned. Right? And we all are fire brigade people. Devotees are fire brigade people. Right? And so much of fire is going around. So we have to go out, running around, trying to extinguish the fire. It's urgent. It's not that. It's not happening. It's happening. Fire is everywhere. So we have to go out and reach out to people and tell people, why are you burning? Why are you burning? Come to Krishna's shelter. Come to the shelter of your devotees, sir. And help them. Help them that they should come forward. Take shelter. That should be done. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? Yes, such day, Prabhu. Yeah, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you for the very nice class. My question is based on the text number one. Compare the purpose in the middle, middle half. The leader of the assembly, Shana Parishi, could estimate the value of this teacher. That's all right. He took the word from it. Then after that, I could not understand. Simply by the uttering Yatha become and Yatha Mati. Therefore, he was very glad to congratulate him and question. Okay. Yes. The question is that Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport, Sutta Goswami, when he said, Yatha Dhitam Yatha Matin. So, Shana Krishi could, could estimate the quality of the speaker, right? Isn't it? Hmm? So, why so? Because you see, th these two words were spoken by Sutta Goswami. It comes in one of the verses before. That when Sutta Goswami said, I will speak Srimad Bhagavatam, then he said, I'll speak in this way, yatha dhitam yatha matim, which means what? I'll speak, uh, I'll speak on the basis of what I have heard and what I have assimilated, what I have realized. So, you see, when he said something like that, it showed his modesty. It showed his modesty. Sudhbhoswami is not saying that I am a perfect speaker of Srimad What he is saying is that I heard and whatever I heard, I understood something. And whatever I understood that I will share with you all. You know, so that shows his modesty that this person is genuine. Okay, you heard and then you understood something and you are going to share what you understood. So then Srimad is saying, we understand that you are an honest person. Right? You are a modest person. You are not claiming to be the most perfect speaker of Sriman Bhagavatam. Right? You are being modest. So that's why he congratulated. All right? Yeah, probably to the point, text, to, text number two, Sutta Goswami's first line, Sutta Goswami is twice addressed, at least on that, Sutta Sutta Mahabha. Mm -hmm. So he's twice addressed, hearing by Sada Goswami. Out of, then he said, out of great joy, because he and the members of the assembly were eager to hear. Now, two things are used here great joy and eager to hear. So, just by stressing on the names two times, of course, as we know that if you stress two or three times, there is an underlying importance to that. But from where does the both come? Great joy also comes and eager to hear also comes. One of them should come. Huh? That should come. No, both can also be there. The both are there. You see, when he saying Sutta Sutta, it means that he is, he is uh, very, uh, it definitely shows that the emotions are high, right? Emotions are high. And when you say it's related to eagerness, so when, when I say I'm eager to hear about something, then naturally joy is a concomitant factor. 
concomitant factors that is underlying actually right because when you say you are eager to hear definitely you must be also happy to hear <laughs> you cannot be sad to hear yeah and last question is on the purpose to text 11 the last three lines there was enough will grain and that is and all the rivers and mountains were full of potential Prabhuji, my question is that what does this line indicate? All the rivers and mountains were full of potency. All the rivers and mountains were full of potency. Potency. Okay, very simple. Okay, river and the mountain. This is very simple meaning. The mountains are reservoirs of so many things. The mountains give us water. The mountains give us vegetation. The mountains give us herbs. The mountains they give us different kinds of fruits and you know it's a, it's a and, uh, different stones in the mountain which can be used for making colors, right? So these are all gifts gifts given by a mountain. So when you say a mountain is full of potency, it means it has all these powers, right? Same thing with the river also. You mean falls in the river and all that? Pearls and all these things. Yeah. Not, not, not just pearl. The purity of the river. I mean, sufficient amount of water is there in the river. That is also a potency. If it is a dry river, then what is the use of that river? Correct. Mm -hmm. Then the water should also be clean. And then as you mentioned, there can be gems in the river. There can be pearls in the river. There can be so many other things in the river. There are two different living entities like fish, etc. And all that. Potency is there. Now in Kaliuga, the rivers have lost their potency. Right? So you find only fish in the river, nothing else. No gems, no pearls, only fish. That also dead fish. Yan Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Dhanur Pranam. Prabhuji, this uh, Brahmanas and Paribrajaka, uh, Sacharya, they are category of Brahman? Not necessarily. I mean, for example, one cannot, one can be born as, one can be born as a shudra, but if that person becomes a devotee and that become, person becomes a preacher, then externally we may say this person is not a brahmana because he was born in a shudra family, but he is doing the work of a brahmana only, no? Right? So, parivrajakacharyas, they may not be by birth brahmanas. But by activity, by deed, they are Brahmanas. Because they were like a Brahman. Brahmana means what? One who works for the spiritual upliftment of the society. That is one of the duties of a Brahmana. So if anyone is doing that, that person is a Brahmana. Yes, Prabhupada. Right? One, one more doubt here. They are one and different simultaneously because they are meant for the same end. Correct. If, if they work for the same end, then they are one and they are known. But, but as, as per this purport, Brahmanas are doing that Vedic, that is material yeah. gain. But if they do it for the right purpose, you see, for example, doing yagyas are also important, no? But they are doing for material gain or something like that. No, Prabhuji. Yeah. The same thing can also be done for spiritual gain. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. It should be done, na? like for example, right. one can do what, an activity, a yagya for material purpose. The same can also be done for spiritual mm -hmm. purpose. Right. So if they do it for spiritual purpose, then their cause is the same. Yes. But when they do for wrong purpose, material purpose, then it's wrong. That, that is not correct only. Correct? Yes. Thank you, Prabhupada. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Ramakrishna Prabhu. Yeah, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Sukhdev Goswami, Sukhdev Goswami stated to be a equibalanced moon is in one place. Yeah. So I'm not able to understand. Understand this equibalanced moon is. Uh, could you please explain? Monist means monism means a uh, one who is uh, one who is absorbed in Brahman. Okay. Uh, that's called monism. Monism means everything is one. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, Shukdev Goswami, he was, uh, in one sense, you can say he was a Brahmavadi. Brahmavadi means absorbed in Brahman. Okay. Monism, right? 
Hmm. So, uh, what is the other word which you mentioned, Prabhuji? Equivalence. Ah, equivalence. So it's, it's a that is a characteristic of monism. If one is a true monist, then there will be equivalence. Equivalence okay. means not affected by any of the three modes of material nature. Okay. Right. So that is that is the point okay. here. So Shukdev okay. Goswami was a Brahmavadi, acting as a Brahmavadi, huh? not a Brahmavadi, acting as a Brahmavadi. Actually, is a devotee of Krishna, but then externally acting as a Brahmavadi, a monist, hmm? who, when he hears Srimad Bhagavatam, huh? when he hears Srimad Bhagavatam, gets attracted to Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, okay. okay Ravi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So then he's teaching the other monists that you should also study Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. okay. Right? Hmm? Okay, Ravi. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. See you on Tuesday. Okay, again the question. Yes, we need them. You can hear me clearly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prabhupada uh, has called out uh, in the explanation of 4.8 uh, verse, no? uh, you had mentioned that uh, when uh, sadhus are invited home, like the uh, purpose should not be only of feeding the sadhus, but to listen to Krishna Pratha and uh, Krishna Kirtan and all. That is more important. But then, uh, what uh, I uh, have observed, like whenever there is such program arranged, the host is totally uh, engaged in uh, all the arrangements, preparations, and with that anxiety, hardly uh, we can put that attention to hearing. But then at the same time, there's a feeling that uh, when sadhus are there, Vaishnavas are at home. So the service is very important. Uh, is that the understanding right, or how is it? Like, which 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 is more important? Hearing to that uh, that time lecture or class, or preparation or serving them is that devotional service is important. Which is important? Everything it should be done in a way that everything is done nicely, right? See, not that this is important. That is not important. The whole thing is that it should be done in a manner. Planning should be done. That everything happens properly. If when we don't do proper planning, then we when then we become into then we get into trouble. Then it's like oh this is left or that is left. This has to be done. That has to be done. You know. Then you end up doing few things and you miss on few other things. But if you plan properly, then everything can be done. Like once it so happened, I'll give you an example. Not I'll not take name. So once uh, there was a big program organized, and a group of devotees they invited a sadhu. So sadhu came. He's giving the class. Only 10, 15 people are sitting in the class. So Maharaj asked, "What about others? Well, they are all in the kitchen. Maharaj cooking." Because hundred people are coming for the program, so then you have to cook also, right? So the man said, okay, so I came here to talk to whom then? I came here to talk to whom? If, if you are in the kitchen and cooking, and if I have to tell you something, which, which is for your benefit, then when will I tell you? Correct. So then Maharaj, Maharaj then told them, I'm not telling you that you should not feed the Vaishnavas. But you can also do this, no? That we will complete the cooking before the class. You know? And when there is class, we will all sit and hear. And after that, we'll serve prasadam. I said, that can also be planned. Anyway, if you are inviting 200 people, 100 people, you're not going to feed hot chapatis to everyone. <laughs> you know, immediately cook chapatis. It's going to be all kept in the you know container and packed, and then you're going to feed. So man, it just needs little planning. One has to be conscious of that. That I have to do in this way that everything is managed, right? So if we if we plan like that, it will be possible that cooking should be done, everything should be done, but then hearing should also be attended. It's a part of it. 
that one should come and hear Krishna Katha. Otherwise, I'll tell you something, Mataji. Sometimes devotees, they do, they get so much involved into seva and they don't do sufficient hearing because of which the mood in which they should be doing the seva gets lost. It just becomes a physical activity. Right? Then Shilapad mentions, then it just becomes a normal karma. That I am doing some work. And you know, then people also start doing that work with grudges. Oh, so much of seva, so much of headache, this, that. Then what is the benefit? If it is seva, it should be joyfully done. Do something properly. And if you don't hear, then it will be just normal labor, no? I'm just putting some labor in there. Right? So hearing should be there. Hearing is so important. Hearing gives us the life. Uh, hearing gives us the spirit of doing the seva. Right? The spirit. There are three things when, when an activity has to be done. What should be done? How should be done? Why should be done? What should be done, I may know. How it should be done, I may also be very skillful at doing it. But why should be done comes from hearing from sadhus. Why it should be done? It should be done for the pleasure of Krishna. Right? Only when we hear, it goes, it goes inside. Otherwise, you forget. So our program planning should be done in that. And for prasadam also, I'll tell you something. Keep prasadam simple, tasty. It should not become the it should not become the most important part of the program. That whole energy goes in prasadam preparation only, right? I tell the devotees why there should be twenty preparations. There should be three or four preparations, nice preparations. Why so much effort in just cooking nice prasadam? You eat that prasadam and then you suffer from diabetes. What's the point? <laughs> What's the point? What's the point? All right. Bindu Mahesh. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Prabhuji, please uh, explain the selfishness is either self-centered or self-extended. Mm. Self-centered means I think about myself. Self-extended means I think about my family, my country, my society. Okay. And Prabhuji, uh, how can you place uh, hippies and uh, Prahlad Maharaj and Dhruv Maharaj in one platform? Not putting them in one platform. I was giving an example that the sadhu goes to the disciple. Mm -hmm. Like Prahlad Maharaj, it's Narad Muni who went to Kayadu. Mm -hmm. In case of Dhruv Maharaj, it's Narad Muni who went to Dhruv Maharaj. But they personally had the desire no, to get it. So the hippies also had desire, no? The hippies, they, they look like ordinary people, but they had desire. Prabhu they were, Maharaj, they Prabhu were into sense enjoyment, no? Prabhu they were into sense enjoyment, but that sense enjoyment was out of frustration. We should know one thing. They went into that kind of sense gratification because they were frustrated from the normal, ordinary sense gratification. They took to drug addiction not because they were sense gratification, they wanted to do sense gratification with drug addiction. They thought drug addiction will give us spiritual emancipation. So that's why those were a different kind of people. Prabhupada even mentions this, that externally you are all hippies. But as soon as you got the chance to become devotees, you took it up so seriously. You know? So internally they had this complete frustration from materialistic life. That's why they were becoming hippies. That we don't want to follow the society, we don't follow, want to follow all the rules and regulations, and, uh, we don't want to do all this. We are tired of it. 
so they were trying lsd marijuana all these things that perhaps in this we will find happiness in this we will find happiness in this we will find happiness so they were looking for happiness they did not know where to find it but they were looking for the real happiness so that desire was there and when they met shri prabhu but so but gave them those things all right so actually this is not bad when people they engage in too much of sense gratification some kind of frustration comes in life you know and then they become fed up of it yeah. what now this is useless i don't want anything and then they become eager for krishna consciousness they become eager but if those who have not got sufficient sense gratification they always have this thinking that maybe it is there is something there there is something there like those people who live in the village they always think city life is very nice <laughs> right even if you tell them you go to the village and you tell them i am coming from mumbai don't come to mumbai they say no 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 we we see in the movie mumbai is very nice you know <laughs> you will tell them no, no don't come to mumbai you stay here only you will be very happy they say no 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 mumbai is very nice so that that hope is there that you know that it is nice but one who has tasted it in manas is not nice okay we have one question in the youtube that is liberated soul same as the shakti vesh avatar liberated soul may be or may not be shakti avesh avatar shakti avesh avatar you have studied right shakti avesh avatar means one on whom special shakti has been invested by krishna to do something special so a liberated soul may be or may not be shakti avesh avatar not necessary that all the liberated souls have the shakti avesh all right we'll stop here thank you very much